Greetings, folks, and welcome to An Eclectic Humanist. Today, I think I'd like to wrap up the little series of ruminations I've been pursuing on the Roe v. Wade decision. Last episode, the focus was largely on what the Bible has to say on the subject of the status of the fetus and the baby, etc. Today, I'd like to pay some attention to a religious political phenomenon known as Dominion Theology, which is deeply influential in the religious right, and as well to look at some really interesting demographics. To begin, I'd like to jump back about 27 years. On August 8th of 1995, at a banquet for the U.S. Taxpayers Alliance in Washington, D.C., Randall Terry, founder of the militant anti-choice organization Operation Rescue, had the following warning for doctors who perform abortions and for any who might act as volunteer escorts. Quote, when I or people like me are running the country, you'd better flee, because we will find you, we will try you, and we will execute you. I mean every word of it. I will make it part of my mission to see to it that they are tried and executed. If we are going to have true reformation in America, it is because men, once again, if I may use a worn-out expression, have a righteous testosterone flowing through their veins. They are not afraid of contempt for the contemporaries. They are not even here to get along. They are here to take over. Somebody like Susan Smith should be dead. She should be dead now. Some people will go, well, how do we know God doesn't have a wonderful plan for her life? He does. It's listed in the Bible. Her plan for her is that she should be dead. End quote. And it's worth noting here that Terry shifts from discussing abortion doctors to discussing Susan Smith, who famously in the mid-90s drowned her two sons in a bathtub after supposedly hearing voices from God. This drawing of a false equivalency between these two categories is actually fairly common, though Terry takes it to the extreme, on the anti-choice side of the discussion. Those who are pro-choice are baby killers, plain and simple. Intellectual honesty and nuance be damned. Terry, of course, isn't unique, and in many ways, he's actually kind of late to the party. This conflict has been coming for a long time. In 1973, having been handed their asses on a long sequence of plates in response to their support of segregation, the Christian right in the U.S. received the most unifying windfall that the complex interactions of religion, politics, and demographics have ever conspired to drop into their laps in the form of the Roe v. Wade decision. Prior to this event, white American Protestants had generally not been unified in opposition to abortion access, but they had been very concerned about maintaining the tax-exempt status of their institutions, while also clinging to the privilege of excluding black people. By the early 70s, though, it was clear that this was a losing fight, and when it became clear that the optics of oppressing racialized minorities were no longer going to work for them, the supposed evils of the women's movement and the sexual revolution became the perfect lightning rod for their need to be righteously superior together. At the same time, particularly among white evangelicals, there was a rising tide of political theology, known alternately as Dominionism, Dominion Theology, Reconstructionism, or Reconstruction Theology. The label Dominion comes from a passage in Genesis where Yahweh, in conversation with Adam and Eve, quote, said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it. You have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. That's Genesis 1 verse 28 in the King James Version. I've used the King James Version here as this is the direct source of the term dominionism as well as being a translation to which many fundamentalist denominations accord a special authority. This myth of having dominion over the earth is transposed in dominionism into politics both domestic and global. The notion of reconstruction, on the other hand, refers to the intention of reconstructing American politics on a biblical model. Its principle, though by no means only early exponent, was Rouses J. Rush Dooney, whose Political Philosophy of History, 1969, and many subsequent works, including Institute of Biblical Law, 1973, The Roots of Reconstructionism, 1991, By What Standard, 1995, and, you're going to love this one, The Mythology of Science, 2001, lay out an extreme fundamentalist vision of history and American exceptionalism that will be all too familiar by now, that the U.S. was founded as a Christian nation with 
Christian values, and that America has been called by God to lead the world to Christianity, that all branches of society must be taken over by dominionists, and that civil law should be based on biblical law. And when I say biblical law, by the way, I am mostly referring to the smitey bits of the Old Testament rather than the more humane bits of books such as Luke. This ideology has all the usual vices of fundamentalism, sometimes seemingly on steroids. It's anti-science, anti-gay, anti-trans, and to the point of this episode, virulently anti-feminist. Some extreme adherents go so far as to condone implicitly or even explicitly capital punishment for crimes such as murder, same-sex intercourse, and adultery, listed as capital offenses in books such as Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. This tendency is also sometimes extended, as with our friend Randall Terry, to those who perform, assist in, or facilitate abortions. Dominionism is deeply embedded in American politics, and not just on the fringes. Public figures with both ties to and talking points in common with Dominionist ideology and organizations include Sarah Palin, Rick Perry, Michelle Bachman, Ted Cruz, Mike Huckabee, and Newt Gingrich. To say nothing of those with past or present ties to the Reconstructionist-leaning think tank Council for National Policy, such as Betsy DeVos, Richard DeVos, Steve Bannon, Kellyanne Conway, the Koch brothers, and Mike Pence. Other historic public figures espousing Dominionist policies include Judge Roy Moore, famous for erecting a stone idol of the Ten Commandments in front of the Alabama Supreme Courthouse, and Phyllis Schlafly, who more than any other individual was responsible for the defeat of the Equal Rights Amendment, and evangelists Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson, among others. This is Christian nationalism at its most rabid, and it is a guiding political ideology of the GOP and much of the American religious right, a group that my cousin, a Christian pastor incidentally, refers to eloquently and accurately as the religious wrong. Now, to be clear, I am not saying, nor do I believe, that every anti-choicer is a dominionist, but the influence that this movement has exerted on the last five decades of American public life, and especially on the Republican Party, can't be exaggerated. It's present in ongoing attacks on science and education, in the endorsement of Christian nationalist candidates from pulpit after pulpit after pulpit, in flagrant violation of the Johnson Amendment, and in the ongoing attempt to exert absolute religiously justified control over every uterus in the U.S. Okay, that was the bad news. There is also good news of a sort, but not the sort that comes without risk. Religious affiliation throughout the developed world, even in the U.S., has been declining for a while now and seems to be approaching a critical point. According to Gallup polls run from 1965 to 2020, the number of Americans who identify religion as very important in their lives has declined from 70% to 49%, with the number saying that it's fairly important having increased slightly from about 22% to 27% and those stating that it's not important, having shot up by more than a factor of six from about 4% to about 25%. According to this same report, weekly worship attendance, which peaked in 1958 at 49%, had declined by 2021 to 29%. Even when weekly attendance is broadened out to mere church membership, as of 2020, the proportion of 49% places churchgoers in a minority for the first time in U.S. history. And it's not just Gallup's data that tell this story. Pew Research reports that the proportion of Christians in the U.S. decreased from 78% in 2007 to 63% in 2021, with the steepest declines reported in Protestantism from 52% to 40%, as opposed to a drop from 24 to 21% among Catholics while the proportion of religiously unaffiliated nearly doubled, increasing from 16% to 29%. When we start digging into the demographics, the picture becomes even more interesting, and I think more revealing, in terms of what's going on right now. Both Pew and American Survey Center report a steady decline in religiosity by generation. For the sake of brevity, I'll focus on just two categories, white evangelical Protestant, which is the demographic driving the anti-choice position, and the religiously unaffiliated. 
That first category breaks down as follows. Silent generation, that is people born between 1925 and 1945, 23%. Boomers, born between 1946 and 1964, 18%. Generation X, born between 1965 and 1980, 16%. Millennials, born between 1981 and 1997, 11%. And Gen Z, born after 1998, 9%. When we shift to the religiously unaffiliated, the numbers present almost a mirror image, with the silent generation at 9%, boomers at 18%, Gen X at 25%, millennials at 29%, and Gen Z at 34%. And this decline in Christianity generally, and evangelical Christianity specifically, is expected to continue over the coming decades, as is the increase of the religiously unaffiliated. So yes, there is good news regarding the numerical decline of white evangelical Christianity in the U.S. Very good news, actually. But what does it mean? How does the rapidly closing demographic window line up with the increasing rabidity with which Christian nationalists are trying to establish their longed-for theocracy, and what does it have to do with Roe v. Wade? Obviously, I can't and won't offer a definitive answer. The question's complex, and a detailed exploration will obviously require more than just a brief snippet, but a few thoughts might be useful. For one thing, general tendencies globally are for religiosity to decrease as economic well-being increases. A society that is doing well economically, in other words, will generally tend to become more secular. While the U.S. is an exception to the trend, being the richest country in the world and also one of the most religious among developed nations, the tendency does play out domestically, with belief in God decreasing as household income increases. And the states with the highest incidence of poverty in the U.S. generally tend to be the most religious. Conversely, the more affluent a given region is, the less religious it tends to be. Poverty, in other words, is good for institutional religion, insofar as religion tends to offer psychological comfort against the trauma of chronic poverty, the palliative narrative that the suffering of poverty has meaning and worth. In the absence of real-world improvements and protections, in other words, make-believe seems to be better than nothing. Thoughts and prayers. These tendencies align with the general positions on the religious right regarding their opposition to policies and programs intended to alleviate poverty and its accompanying suffering, be it through public education, social assistance, or medical care. And they align with the dogged Christian nationalist commitment to banning abortion, which, if successful, will consign yet more people to lives of poverty and desperation, absent the educational and economic means for self-improvement or even, at times, self-preservation. This move will also disempower women as a social class, bringing them into line with the most regressive religious notions of gendered subjugation by effectively confining them to motherhood roles. But their time is running out, and they know it. Exactly those denominations that pose the greatest threat to women's bodies and lives are the denominations bleeding members faster than any others. If they're going to establish their theocratic promised land in America, they have very few years left in which to do so. And this pressure, this awareness of the demographic clock running out, makes them more dangerous than they have ever been. And the decisions that the Supreme Court's made speak to the kind of hurry they're in. Within a relatively few days, we've seen the stripping away of yet more gun regulations in the wake of the worst mass shooting in the last 10 years in American history. We've seen the stripping away of bodily sovereignty from anyone who has a uterus. We've seen the decision to grant tax dollars to religiously affiliated schools. And we've seen as well the lifting of the regulation that police read arrested people their Miranda rights just two days before the Roe decision came down. They're in a hurry, and they're making damn good use of their time. But why am I, a Canadian, bothering to weigh in on this? Roe v. Wade is an American court decision that has no bearing on Canadian law, and at least in theory, Canada has had a better track record on reproductive freedom than the U.S. for years now. But, as the saying goes, when the U.S. sneezes, Canada catches cold. Very little happens south of the border that doesn't have some ripple effect here, and lately, the U.S. has been sneezing rather a lot. 
Other symptoms are easy to come by. The increase in hate crimes in Canada following the election of Donald Trump, for instance, or the intellectually and morally infantile reaction among many on the right to such basic measures as masking and vaccinating during a pandemic. The border between our two countries may be an administrative reality, but it's also a cultural illusion. If the U.S. takes another hard turn to the far right, it's fair to expect those currents to have eddies up here. And while the majority of voters in Canada support reproductive rights, it would be deeply unwise in fractious political times to take anything for granted, especially given how much American money poured into Conservative Party coffers during the last federal election. It's also worth pointing out that I live in a province, New Brunswick, whose access to abortion services has yet to meet mandated federal standards. Services are only offered in two communities province-wide, neither of which, as of a couple of years ago, happens to be the provincial capital. Another province to the north, Prince Edward Island, provides no services at all, with the result that anyone there who needs an abortion has to come either here or to Nova Scotia. The need to travel long distances places those with limited means at a disadvantage, and the political will to bring either province's services up to what federal law actually requires seems, in both cases, to be lacking. I also happen to teach in a human rights department. As such, questions of human dignity, such as that which is undermined when a person is forced to give birth against their will in service to someone else's ideology, are never far from my mind. I am constantly and sometimes viscerally aware of what it looks like when people's authority over their own bodies is stripped from them and sickeningly familiar with the number and variety of excuses that have been put forward to justify that theft of agency and how very often religion has been used as all or part of the excuse. Moreover, I am a father of a daughter. The cultivation of my daughter's character and dignity is the most important commitment in my life, and being her father has been my greatest joy. She is a happy and healthy teenager, and the thought of her agency being stolen from her and her own body being forced to labor in service to someone else's beliefs fills me with a cold rage, all the colder for knowing that there are people in my society who would offer up pious justifications for that theft of autonomy and cross themselves complacently while so doing. And yet, as happy as she is, and as much joy as she has experienced herself and brought to my life, if her mother, when pregnant, had opted for an abortion, I know that I would have supported that choice. I know this because I had the same respect for her bodily sovereignty then that I am giving voice to here regarding any other bearer of a uterus. And, just to head off the obvious and obviously cheap emotional move that an anti-choicer might bring up in response to what I just said, yes, I would apply the same standard to my own mother if, when she was pregnant with me, she had decided to abort me. While I love my life, and believe it has been a good life, there is nothing special about me. Prior to being born, I had no more claim on existence than does anybody else. And finally, I am an autonomous person who demands that his own bodily sovereignty be respected and who maintains the absolute right to defend that sovereignty by any means necessary, whether verbal or physical, legal or illegal. Claiming that right for myself, I am obliged to extend it to everybody else and to stand with those from whom it is currently being stripped, particularly those in my own society, and thus necessarily to stand against those ideologies that constitute a clear and present danger to the autonomy and dignity of human persons. This is the solidarity that my ethics compel me to offer, because I know were I in that position myself, it is what I would want and what I would claim as my inalienable right from any and all of you. And with that, I think I'll stop talking now. Thank you very much for listening. If you are interested in following or contacting me, you can find me on the Eclectic Humanist Facebook page at EC Humanist on Twitter or through email at eclectic.humanist at gmail.com. If you've enjoyed this or found it useful, please share it. That's about the only way anyone starting up a new channel has any chance of attracting viewers. And if you're accessing this on YouTube, please consider liking and subscribing. I'm hoping the project will have some longevity, but ultimately, that all depends on you. For now, though, whether or not you intend on coming back, I'm grateful for your time. Be safe, be informed, and be kind to each other.